All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for an armchair tour of the Codman Estate with Historic New England. We're going to enjoy an armchair tour of the Codman Estate, a famous Massachusetts property preserved by Historic New England. The five generations of the Codman family uh, to live here left their mark, and the estate that was originally a country retreat gradually came to symbolize the family's distinguished past. The interiors, richly furnished with portraits, memorabilia, and artworks uh, collected in America and Europe, preserve the decorative schemes of every era, including those of noted interior designer Ogden Codman Jr. The grounds feature a hidden Italianette garden, uh, circa 19, uh, uh, 1900s, with perennial beds uh, and a reflecting pool filled with water lilies, as well as an English cottage garden. Um, and so uh, this presentation is uh, led by uh, Wendy Hubbard, who is a site manager at Historic New England. Hopefully I didn't butcher too much of that, Wendy. Uh, so all nearly 200 of us who are watching live and the many more that will watch the recording, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Wendy for joining us here today. And Wendy, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Um, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, and or good evening, depending on where you are. And we'll get uh, started right away with the Codman Estate in Lincoln, Massachusetts. So today, um, uh, our themes are a multi-generational family home, uh, their family fortunes, the architectural evolution and preservation of the Codman Estate, We'll also be talking about the collectors, the connoisseurs, and the tastemakers, their possessions, and their interior design choices. We'll also have a conversation about the staff who worked and lived here on the estate, enabling the Codman family's lifestyle. Historic New England is the oldest, largest regional preservation and education organization in the country. We own and operate 38 historic properties all around New England, some in the states of, from which you are um, tuning in. So thank you all for joining me. Just going to make sure I got my, my next slide. Hold on. Here we go. Perfect. Codman Estate is a long um, and multi-layered history. Um, we start our story of the family in 1708. But before we get to that, um, I want to give you a little background on these five generations. The surnames um, of the owners of the property changed over time from Chambers to Russell to Codman through marriage and inherited property, um, but it was a continuous family line starting in the early colonial times of 1708, right up through uh, the last Codman family member to live here, Miss Dorothy Codman, um, in 1968. So that's a long stretch of American history. Um, the estate at its height was 680 acres. Today, Historic New England cares for the estate's remaining 16 acres immediately surrounding this house. When you visit, much of the surrounding green space and land that you see was once part of the estate and is now owned by the town of Lincoln who preserves it as conservation land. Also in 1968, when the property came to historic New England, the bequest not only included the house, the interior, the uh, collections, uh, the landscape, the gardens, um, but it also contained 100 linear feet of Codman family papers. So imagine 100 feet of um, archival boxes stuffed with files and family papers. That's a lot of information. And those archival documents um, record and trace the history of um, the other people who lived and worked on the estate for over two centuries. And the scope of this um, archival collection really does make uh, this a significant record of New England life. Uh, in today's talk, we'll see interiors and collections reflective primarily of the final two generations, their lifestyle, their preservation choices, um, some of the progress and changes uh, that they made, and the servant's way. 
Um, but we're going to start um, in the Wayback Machine, where, um, of course, prior to European colonization, um, this uh, landscape, uh, the Native Americans called the Concord Area, which uh, also included what would become Lincoln, Muscatoquid, or March, Marsh Grass River. Um, it is the traditional, it was and is the traditional home of the Nipmuc people, who are descendants, descendants of indigenous Algonquin. And it was the landscape, the confluence of the Sudbury, Assabet, and Concord rivers, which were important to local indigenous people for hunting and fishing, uh, farming and settlements. The area's wetlands um, and rivers and marsh provided rich and fertile uh, land and are still present and visible today. Because of the richness of this land, it became a target uh, for European colonizers who annexed the land resulting in the displacement of indigenous people. Today, nearly 600 members or more, the Nipmuc people are a state acknowledged tribe in Massachusetts and continue to be one of New England's most historic and largest native communities. Thank you to the historic New England, uh, the, excuse me, the Lincoln Historical Society's map um, of uh, the area. Um, this is a land map that shows um, where you see Spinea because historic New England was once known as the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities. Thankfully, we've shortened our name to Historic New England, but this is um, the area which we currently inhabit. But the, uh, the, um, the map shows the extent of the uh, land acquisition uh, through uh, this area, once called Concord, now called Lincoln. And with all that um, farming land, um, the owners needed work. And so there were, um, in the 17th and into the 18th century, um, this was the largest slave owning farm in the area with the largest number of enslaved people on it. And what you're looking at here is an inventory page from uh, 1767 of Chambers Russell, one of the owners, and we have uh, the names of uh, some of the people owned uh, by Chambers Russell, Peter, Mingo, Osmond, Titus, Caesar. And we know there were other enslaved people on this estate and children born into slavery here. We know one, um, at least one known episode of uh, family separation where a child was separated from his family and um, given or sold uh, elsewhere. Margaret Russell was the niece of Chambers Russell, and uh, she married John Codman III um, in uh, the early part of the 18th century, mid part of the 18th century. And because she was a female heir, the Chambers uh, Russell estate became the Codman estate. She married John Codman III, and both Margaret and her husband, uh, John, were stewards of the estate on behalf of their young son, uh, Charles Russell Codman. John Codman III, as I say, married Margaret in 1781, so later 18th century. He was a very prominent Massachusetts uh, merchant um, engaged in um, the Atlantic trade, shipping and international trade and commerce, um, and made his fortune primarily on the economy here in New England and the American South and the um, West Indies on an economy based uh, on enslavement. All subsequent generations, um, including the Codman Family Trust that we continue to benefit from today, um, we owe uh, the fortune to an economy based on slavery. John Codman III made the um, estate the grand place that you see today. Uh, he expanded the house, added a third floor, laid out the um, buildings and ground, uh, laid out the grounds as you see them today. This very formal parterre or these formal steps leading up uh, to the front door, this very prominent and grand uh, front entryway. He was eager to maintain the neoclassical um, style of the original. Uh, mansion added other classical details in terms of the front porch and the columns, the pediment, 
the dental molding and the capitals. John Codman also added a servant's wing. So this is the main body of the house. And he added in 1799, this uh, servant's wing. Part of the landscape when you come to visit includes this very quaint and charming octagon um, meadow that was primarily used for animal husbandry. And it contains what's called a haha -ha wall. Now, those of you in the UK probably know what this means. Uh, this was an idea that uh, John Codman III got on his visits uh, to England. And basically, it is a um, scene from the prominence of the mansion above on the top of the hill looking out across the landscape. It is a um, almost like an infinity pool. It's like an invisible wall that you only come to see when you get up close, um, as you see from uh, this vantage point, that there's a wall here. So, aha, uh -huh, uh, there's a wall here. His son, Charles Russell Codman, inherited this glorious home and um, beautiful landscape, um, but was not interested in living out in uh, the country and had a very cosmopolitan and urbane lifestyle. And so he sold the property out of the family. His son, Ogden Codman uh, Sr., seen here, uh, married Sarah Bradley Codman. And as a young couple, um, full of um, enthusiasm and wealth, uh, were eager to uh, reclaim the family estate and embarked on um, the project um, and renamed the property The Grange, kind of a gentleman's um, farm. So these two were absolutely um, delighted to uh, reclaim not only the, the mansion and the landscape, but also many of the antiques and furnishings uh, that the family owned in previous um, centuries or years. They worked with uh, Codman's brother-in-law, a prominent Boston architect named John Hubbard Sturgis. And in 1863, 1864, um, basically built a new carriage barn, added plumbing, heating, made several stylistic changes, refurbished and, refur and furnished the interior rooms with family furniture, art, and objects. Um, and they also made additional acquisitions of objects in Europe and America as well. But they were also very careful to preserve and maintain many of the original and important colonial and federal era, era features of the landscape and the architecture. So the landscape that you visit today actually looks very much like this 1855 um, image of the Codman uh, family's children. Here's a couple sitting on the ha ha wall um, on their ponies. And this is the main drive up into the estate. And you will see Grandfather John's picturesque elms here um, in this photograph, uh, making this very grand allee as you approach the mansion. And I'm just bringing your attention to this um, bed of um, annual plants and canas uh, because you'll see that. Uh, later on in another slide. So the people that um, you're going to see as we step through the door will be the people from this era, this um, late 19th, early 20th century um, era. Uh, here they are taking tea with uh, Lady Grey Edgerton, um, an, an English aristocrat and with her daughter Violet on the Codman family uh, piazza. So the straw boater hats and the very Victorian garb kind of help place this um, in the era we will see on the inside. Just a note about those beautiful elm trees. Of course, in the 1930s, they succumbed to Dutch elm um, and we replanted and it is a grand allee, but it's no longer, unfortunately, grandfather John Codman III's elms. Known as a mansion in its own time, this was a very impressive manor house from the very start. You're looking at original 1740s woodwork in the staircase uh, triple helix or double helix newel post and the triple design banisters uh, in the main hall. 
These were taken from English pattern books uh, sent over to the uh, colonies here in the Americas. And it's American craftsmanship based on an English tradition. You'll also notice that there are other layers of history beyond uh, the 1740s original structure, including mint and tile here on the floor and some Asian uh, ceramics. So it's a very rich and multi-layered interior um, that really represents lots of different family influences and choices over time. We'll step through into the paneled parlor. This is part of the original 1740s house with the original uh, paneling, the architectural detail is intact and in situ, meaning in place in this uh, room. It was very carefully maintained by John Codman and his wife, Margaret, and their son, Charles Russell Codman, and his son, Ogden Codman Sr. It was Ogden Codman Jr., noted architect and interior designer who painted it white um, in the fashion of the colonial revival era of the early 1900s, and, uh, yes, 1900s. You'll also see in this photograph um, French toile fabric um, and blue and white uh, ceramics from Asia. Um, it is a room that was um, refurbished uh, fairly recently in the 2000s um, by the curatorial staff with conservation work on the furnishings, art, um, and the uh, fabric were reproduced. And part of that fabric where you see reproduced fabric in the house is because the family saved all of these materials and the archival materials and the documents um, also had scraps of, of fabric. So we were able to um, reproduce the color, but also the repeat of the pattern um, in this beautiful French toile. And you'll see their um, taste in American and European art and furniture um, throughout the house. Mrs. Uh, Sarah Bradley Codman's family was in the Asia trade and she had a preference for blue and white uh, ceramics. So in their case, John uh, Ogden Codman Sr. and Sarah Bradley Codman, money married money, which made a very fruitful uh, partnership. We'll step through into the dining room, which is a very different flavor indeed. This was uh, designed by John Hubbard Sturgis, a noted architect and interior designer and brother-in-law to Ogden Codman Sr. And John Hubbard Sturgis's taste ran to high Victorian with a, an emphasis on the revival mode. And so this evokes a kind of Tudor um, splendor with uh, butternut fretwork on the ceiling, heavy uh, woodwork, heavy furnishings, and this was uh, John Hubbard Sturgis's claim to fame and uh, reproduced um, Gothic revival, Tudor revival and other kinds of revival uh, for Victor wealthy Victorians um, here in the United States. The furniture uh, in the dining room was acquired by a very fashionable uh, New York furniture dealer named Leon Marcotte as an ensemble. So very heavy, dark, um, Victorian furniture here in this space. And you can just see some of this uh, blue and white uh, china as well. Um, there's Canton, there's Minton, there's even a couple of little souvenir plates because the Codman family also liked to go visit historic houses and pick up a little souvenir in the gift shop. So quite charming. And I'm just gonna back up. Over the sideboard here in the dining room is one of the most beautiful paintings in the historic New England collection. It's a 17th century Dutch still life uh, masterpiece by Willem Klaus Heda. Um, it's known as a vanitas uh, painting or um, that life is fleeting. The symbolism includes a half eaten pie. Uh, we've got this lemon peel. There's a, a time piece here, a half filled uh, glass. So it's a reminder that um, time is fleeting. We're stepping through into yet another flavor of um, architectural and interior design detail in the drawing room. This is part of that 1799 John Codman III's um, structure. Um, 
and it has original architectural features from his era, including this neoclassical federal period of chimney piece, and you can see the dental molding around the ceiling. But this again has been redecorated um, by uh, the Codman family in the late 19th and early 20th century. And this particular room really does, in fact, represent um, a lot more of Ogden Codman uh, Jr.'s style and taste um, that was not present in the dining room. The dining room, high Victorian, the drawing room, a little bit lighter, a little bit fresher, preserving the federal um, period colonial architectural detail, but introducing a new brighter wall color, sort of robin's egg blue, um, a casual flower chintz uh, slip covers here. And Ogden Codman Jr. was an, a noted architect and interior designer. Uh, and he co-authored a, a book called On the Decoration of Hou Houses with his friend and author Edith Wharton. Now this was Edith Wharton's first published work um, here in the United States. And their philosophy was to return to the classicism um, after the excesses of the Victorian era and create light, bright, comfortable, uh, casual spaces. So among um, the better known works of Ogden Codman Jr. include Cornelius Vanderbilt's uh, home, The Breakers, some of the rooms there in Newport, Rhode Island, um, the Hampshire House in Boston, Mass. Uh, he remodeled and redecorated some of the rooms in uh, Kaikit in upstate New York for the Rockefellers uh, in the Hudson River Valley. Ogden Codman Jr. will be um, one of four um, bachelor interior designers uh, featured in uh, the new exhibition opening at our Eustace Estate in Milton, Mass, um, called The Importance of Being Furnished. So I put the website in the chat and my contact information there as well. So if you have um, any curiosity about that exhibit or about Ogden Cod Codman Jr., feel free to reach out. We're gonna step through and here he is, uh, Ogden Codman Jr. as a young man with his carte de visite um, produced in Dinard, uh, France, where the family lived for a time. And as an older gentleman here, he uh, lived out his life primarily uh, in the south of France. He was a gay man, um, by the way, and um, the only of his um, five siblings to actually marry, he married a lovely woman by the name of Lila Griswold Webb, a wealthy widow. Um, they had a lovely uh, marriage and they were compatible in, in taste and, and personality, and he was devastated um, upon her death. But, you know, human beings are complicated, and um, he also was attracted to men and probably in the LGBTQ plus um, you know, um, uh, Rainbow, he would probably consider himself queer, um, but they didn't have that kind of language uh, for that at the time. So his life, his work, um, and his choices will be part of the discussion uh, for the importance of being furnished five bachelors at home in the new exhibit. Ogden Codman Jr. advised his siblings that since they no longer played billiards, that it wasn't in fashion anymore, that they removed this great chunky piece of furniture um, from the billiard room and create a comfortable library. So myth has it that um, they removed this out the large window in the library and like you do kind of set it on the side of the street with a free sign on it. Someone has that billiard table, perhaps somewhere in Lincoln, Massachusetts. We just don't know. So this is um, one of the most comfortable rooms in the house, but it's also a room where the fabric has not been reproduced or restored. So it was a very bright, beautiful, highly Victorianized um, space. For example, these silk pillows um, of chinoiserie fabric were bright blue. You can just get a little sense of the rose uh, damask on the comfy chair and the velvet curtains were emerald green. So this would have been a jewel-toned, beautiful space um, as a library. In it are family portraits, including Ogden Codman Jr.'s brother, Hugh, with his violin uh, there under his arm. And we've stepped upstairs uh, to um, the 
um, uh, bedroom of Mr. and Mrs. Codman. Again, matching furniture from Leon Marcotte, the fashionable uh, furniture dealer in New York City. Again, the robin's egg blue and the painted uh, paneling uh, a la Ogden Codman Jr. And fresh reproduction fabric based on um, the samples that uh, we know exist. The Codmans wanted to live in comfort. And while um, they, their early colonial house was magnificent, it was um, not terribly comfortable for uh, modern um, bathing. And um, so they modernized their uh, bathrooms. And um, before 1874, the water was pumped from the well by hand uh, and carried up to the uh, wash stands. Um, by 1899, new water pumps, pipes were installed, and then the plumbing in 1903 was updated one more time. And you just notice the pipes actually run uh, on the exterior wall because part of their preservation ethic was not to tuck into some of these early 1740s um, wall spaces, but to treat them re with respect and run the pipes um, out be so they didn't have to take down and, dis and damage original structural and interior walls. Now, some of those people who were pumping and carrying water um, were some of the servants. And we have a photograph here of Ellen, Nellie, Mary, Marie-Renne here, Watson Tyler, and the dog Rover. Now, many employees lived and worked uh, on the grounds and in the house, uh, making their lifestyle possible. Parlor maids, chamber maids, cooks, nannies, caretakers, chauffeurs, and very specific individuals who served on the estate. By the 1890s, early 1900s, there were generally four women working in the house, a cook, a parlor maid, and a chamber maid, Marie Renne, um, Watson Tyler and another gentleman, Philip Place. Um, each of those three worked on the estate for their entire adult lives over 40 years. Most of the other servants turned, turned over fairly regularly, um, but these were not the only employees who worked on the state. Estate cleaning women, landscape workers, laundresses were not part of the uh, regular staff, but hired and paid by the job. Um, as was a hired man generally under the supervision of Watson Tyler um, to do odd jobs or um, haying or plowing, those kinds of specific tasks in the landscape. Marie-Ren Lucas came from France um, and began her work as a nursemaid caring for um, their youngest daughter, Dorothy Codman. And then when Dorothy no longer needed her, Marie-Ren became somewhat of a lady's maid um, and housekeeper, and she was the only servant to live on the family side of the house. We have um, reopened and reclaimed some of the servants' bedrooms and spaces in the servants' wing. The servants' wing was added um, in 1899, this extra um, attachment to the back of the house. And uh, this is one of the rooms recently restored and uh, furnished by the curators. This happened last year, so this is brand new. And the servant's wing was primarily, the bedrooms were for maids and cooks, and they uh, turned over quite frequently, and we don't have specific information about them, but we have for one person, Nora Scanlon, a parlor maid, um, who was employed here and is listed in the 1900 census. So from that document, we were able to discover enough genealogical details to create a short sketch of her life in service and beyond. And we like to tell this story because many people relate, I think, a little more to the servants who came and went in this house rather than the grand um, uh, land and slave owners here. So we'll just start with a little story of Nora Scanlon and see if anybody um, has family members that can relate uh, to this personally. So Nora was born on Nora Agnes Scanlon in Ballyford, County Kerry, Ireland uh, in 1872. And she emigrated to the United States in 1894 as a steerage passenger on Cunard Line SS Gallia. And when she arrived in Boston, she told the immigration uh, officials that she, um, her profession, her profession was servant, and she was hired by the Codmans along with a chambermaid named Agate Agnes. 
And Nora and Agnes worked for the Codmans until November 100, when the Codmans left for an extended stay in Europe, which they normally um, would do. And Nora gave Mrs. Codman her address and expressed an interest that she be rehired when they returned. So in spring of 1902, um, Nora came back to work. There she met her future husband, Dennis Joseph Welch, who lived nearby, employed as a farm laborer, another recent Irish immigrant, and they were close in age, and they filed their intention to marry um, in Lincoln in March of 1903, and in April, Nora gave her notice and left uh, the employment as a servant. And Nora and Dennis lived in Lincoln for most of their marriage, uh, as many of their five children were born. But eventually they moved to Chelsea, Mass., where they owned a home. Dennis uh, worked industrial jobs, and Nora was a homemaker. Dennis died in 1933. And Nora, after his death, continued to live in their home and took in lodgers and boarders. And she died in Chelsea, Massachusetts in 1964. So we're really proud to tell Nora's story, and we were able to con reconstruct her, her life primarily because she happened to be there in 1900. And so we were able to pull together much of her biographical data, as well as notes from Sarah Bradley Codman's diaries and letters. So today, um, we have a servant's tour that shows you these um, back spaces, the servant's back stairs, the coal cellar, the attic, Nora's bedroom, and some of the kitchens. Here are Nora's documents um, that you can uh, see in laminated form, uh, copies, um, with her obituary, her um, census, her steerage passage, her marriage license, and those kinds of things and a Dublin book of Irish verse on the side of her bed table. Here in the servants hall, this is a space that would have been um, in existence in 1799 as uh, a kitchen. It was turned into the servants hall um, when they added on the kitchens uh, further behind this space along the servants L. And we'll start here because um, in addition to being a place that they would stage to serve into the dining room. Um, this was where servants would have taken their own meals. And in here, there's a communication center. It includes this little internal uh, house phone that you could call the different rooms, but also an annunciator. So those of us in the US who are fans of Masterpiece Theater probably recognize this kind of thing from Downton Abbey and uh, upstairs, downstairs. So um, there are call buttons in the main family rooms and they could push a button and the annunciator would let the servants know who needed help where. And the table shows fairly, you know, modest kind of um, setup with uh, their tea and apples and other kinds of things for their own meals. The pantry has numbers of sets of dishes, a lot of blue and white in here. Um, and this would have been uh, used for serving the family and clean up as well. And then we're stepping into what's called the new kitchen, new only because it has the newfangled technology of the um, wooden coal stove and a water heater uh, tank or copper here and an additional kitchen sink here. So cooking was hot, physical labor, chopping, rolling dough, tenderizing meat, hefting large mixing bowls, pots, pans. Cooks had a long day, up early to make breakfast, uh, through tea and dinner, and they would have to keep the range going all day, hot in the summer. They, this would have meant lugging coal from the cellar. So Ogden Common Jr. wrote to his mother um, and thought that the problem that his mother had with keeping a good cook is that she needed a kitchen maid to help with some of the drudgery. And he wrote to her, excuse me, I fancy that you would only keep a tolerably decent cook um, with a kitchen maid. And so we know that one was hired. Um, apple pie making here and butter churns. So the laundry is the next room and that, um, was primarily someone who was employed as a day laborer. 
Again, it tended to be a young female Irish immigrant who came uh, to the house a couple of times a week uh, to do the washing in-house, but very often things would have been taken out of the home and washed in uh, other homes where laundresses um, had their businesses. The Codmas also used commercial laundries, including this one, Luando's, with various branches in Cambridge and Roxbury and Brookline, um, and the Boston branch in the main office of Temple Place, downtown Boston. Um, so we know that uh, the Codmans used this laundry because we have their invoices and payments in their um, documents. So we've got a very faint laundry line that is hung, was hung and strung behind the servant's wing and behind the laundry here. It also shows the original 1900 greenhouse, which is no longer there. Now, Watson Tyler, who started his work um, at the Codman Estate um, as a chauffeur, but quickly moved up, <clears throat> basically was a black Canadian born in 1845 in Nova Scotia. And he immigrated to the United States with his wife and his oldest children in the 1870s and was working on um, the Codman estate by the early 1800s. And he remained here um, for the rest of his life. He died in 1922. Um, he did not live on the property. He had a home for his um, uh, family just up on uh, Concord Road, 98 Concord Road in Lincoln. And his descendants still live there today. Watson was um, in charge of most things uh, outside in the landscape um, and seemingly everything else that occurred uh, on the grounds uh, that came under his purview, farm chores, gardening, planting and pruning trees, caring for lobster, livestock, um, getting the house and grounds in order uh, for their family, for the family's returns from their travels. Um, and while the family was uh, away, Watson served as the estate's caretaker. So 1909, uh, here in Lincoln, the Vegetable Garden. And uh, the Codmans were interested in free ranging before free ranging was, you know, a thing um, today. Anyway, though, here are Tom Codman's turkeys in March of 1900, kind of pecking away on the front uh, formal parterres of the mansion. We actually do some really fun Codman Community Farm, which was part of the estate until uh, Dorothy's death in 1968 when the town purchased the farm. Um, we actually do um, program partnerships with Codman uh, Community Farm. Here's the barn. And we know that the Codmans were canning because here are the cans of tomatoes and uh, bottles of sherry and jam and other kinds of things that are still uh, in storage um, in their cold store down in the basement of the Codman family home. And here is Mrs. Codman uh, taking tea uh, with the brass um, tea serving thing here that's still in the dining room with some friends on the outside of the house. They love to entertain by taking tea. And so we duplicated uh, the, that tea. Actually, I made all these things that you see here today on the slide uh, from the Codman family recipes. And it includes uh, some scones and a Dutch cake called apple puffert and uh, shortbread and gingerbread and candied orange peel. And uh, we've got some quince jelly there strawberries and cream. Now the Codman's recipe for Devonshire cream includes milking the cow, setting the uh, milk aside to let the cream rise to the top for 24 hours, then um, taking it and hand whipping it with a little bit of sugar. My recipe includes a KitchenAid, um, a trip to the grocery store, and some heavy cream sugar and vanilla. So I prefer my recipe. But it's very fun to go through those original rep recipes and see what works um, for today's kitchens. And we do that with um, Codman family uh, gardens uh, and programs together. Okay, so the Italian inspired garden was installed in 1900. Um, Ogden Codman Jr. advised his mother about this, creating this classically uh, formal place with informal uh, New England flower beds. And he suggested to narrow the lawn as it extended away 
um, from your original vantage point to create the illusion of depth and spaciousness. And we're lucky that the uh, Massachusetts Master Gardeners adopted the Codman Estate um, as a project for um, about five years. They've been working on um, the gardens and the landscape on our behalf, and we thank them very, very much. See this beautiful bit of peonies um, in bloom, classical statuary, also terracotta urns from Florence uh, in place here. The shady side and the sunny side with perennial beds. It's a lovely place, and we often rent uh, the Codman Estate for weddings, as you can imagine. So, in contrast to the Italian inspired garden, is Dorothy's garden, which is um, on the opposite corner of the estate uh, next to the carriage barn. And this was inspired by the arts and crafts movement. Um, and Gertrude Jekyll may be familiar to some of you, UK and US uh, gardeners. Um, her idea was a less formal um, uh, garden with uh, perennial beds and climbing roses, clematis. There's a little um, little tiny reflecting pool here that's hidden uh, behind the foliage. And so um, these plants emerge in a succession of bloom from spring to fall. And there's a preservation project underway right now to stabilize some of the arbor seating um, and a little table with an arch. Uh, near that garden. And today, um, we also use the grounds for various um, large activities like the annual um, Arts and Crafts Festival with wonderful ven vendors coming to sell their wares. And it's just a lovely place for people to um, walk where the Codman Estate is actually at the nexus of over 80 miles of conservation trails that zigzag across Lincoln. And so we get lots of landscape visitors um, coming uh, and using the um, our parking as the trailhead, which we're happy for them to do so. Um, and we uh, look forward to seeing some of you come, to a, come for a visit. So to wind up, in 1968, uh, the property came to historic New England uh, because it was the Codman family's intent to preserve the homes and grounds, and I quote, as a specimen of New England country estate. And that bequest provides us today with a valuable view of these five generations of uh, family bonds and over 225 years of New England history. And we um, intentionally tell the story of uh, many diverse lives, including those enslaved here, um, those immigrants who came to the United States for work, uh, those folks working on the land, and um, as well as the family members. So uh, premiering uh, this spring is the LGBTQ Pride Tour that is um, in concert with the importance of being furnished. Uh, and you can go to the website to find uh, dates for that program when uh, it gets posted. And we look forward to visiting uh, with you uh, here on the Codman Estate, which is open June through October on the second and fourth Saturday of the month. The first tour of the day is always the servant's tour. And we um, take the sheets off and start unwrapping the house in April, which means that in May, should you want to book a private group tour, give me a ring or um, look me up on my email there in the chat and we can um, make an appointment for you to come and see the Codman House and Grounds at your leisure. So let's just see if that's our last one. I believe it is. So that's historicnewengland.org is our website. And I'm just going to go back to a prettier picture. There we go. And open it up for questions, Robert. Great. So folks, let's give uh, Wendy a big virtual round of applause for a wonderful presentation. And uh, we can take uh, 10 minutes or questions of, of questions. Uh, so Edward would Edward would like to know, is Codman Square in Boston named after this same family? Yes, it is. Um, it was a pastor, I believe, a minister um, who uh, I believe it was um, early 18th century, and I'm, I'm having a mental cramp on his name, but it's um, in Dorchester, Codman Square is named for the Codman family, yes. Maria would like to know, are there any living descendants? 
So not in this line. Um, interestingly, out of the five children, so Ogden Codman Jr., um, Alice, Tom, Hugh, and Dorothy, um, only Ogden Codman Jr. married Lila Webb. They did not have any children. After her death, um, his relationships um, manifested as single sex relationships, primarily in France. Um, we believe his brother, uh, Tom, was also a gay man and maintained a continuous um, friendship with one person. His cousin, Howdy, also was out, um, prominent, and an author, um, and uh, basically was married to his partner. Um, and there were other uh, lesbian couples as well um, within the family. We're not sure about um, Alice and her sexuality, only because she died fairly young. And we do know that Dorothy... Um, we don't, we, her, her, um, sexual preferences are less known, um, and a bit more ambiguous, but she was what was called a spinster, um, which is to a certain degree, a little bit of a derogatory term, uh, nowadays because she chose to remain single. They had enough sort of, you know, wealth and privilege where they didn't have to necessarily marry for, you know, that kind of, um, step up the status ladder. And, um, Dorothy was the youngest, and she never really indicated um, why she didn't marry. Um, but we know that um, Hugh was infatuated with um, his, because he was a musician with his um, uh, female um, uh, musician friend, and but his mother didn't think that she was uh, a sufficient um, rank and social status that um, he would be able to marry her. So that romance was kind of scotched early on and then he developed Parkinson's disease in midlife so um, you know his health concerns kind of laid out a track that was um, unfortunate for him and um, so you know Ogden, Tom, Hugh, Alice died young and Dorothy lived to a ripe old age but we just don't know so now, no, it, no direct descendants from this particular family line, but Ogden Codman Sr. had lots of um, brothers and sisters, as did Sarah Bradley Codman. So there are aunts and uncles and cousins um, and folks that descend through, um, through the Codman family, but not this particular line. In fact, the portrait of John Codman III, which is a John Singleton Copley portrait hanging in the house, was owned by one of those cousins who then uh, donated it to us at Historic New England. Um, and one of the features, actually, what we're looking at her, uh, one of the features of the Italian garden is now this um, uh, reproduction uh, statue of Flora, and that was um, basically paid for by a Hubbard uh, family descendant. So that was reproduced um, with donations from a descendant. And as I mentioned, the Codman Family Trust uh, Ogden Codman Sr. Um, set up the property in trust um, for his family, and uh, that trust continues today, um, and we benefit from it for various capital projects. And, and in fact, so, uh, the town of Lincoln does as well. Miss Dorothy Codman was a quiet philanthropist, and um, her money through the Codman Family Trust goes primarily to um, elderly people in Lincoln and other kinds of, you know, um, worthy um, needs, needs based. She was a very quiet philanthropist and um, did good deeds for individual people around town. Uh, so, uh, so, oh, sorry, a, a little bit of an echo. <laughs> so um, a couple of uh, comments, then we'll get back to questions. Uh, C uh, says that she loved this. You're a wonderful presenter. She enjoyed your voice. Uh, are your other lectures listed on your website? Yes, historicnewengland.org. I think you have to go to book a speaker tab. I'm not sure where that is on the website, but all of the site managers at Historic New England do armchair tours. I myself oversee four properties. So the Codman Estate in Lincoln, the Gropius House, a 1938 mid-century modern icon of architecture um, uh, in you know, sort of the Bauhaus style. And that's a good one. And I do also the Cooper Frost Austin House, which is the oldest house in Cambridge, uh, 1681. And I oversee the Brown House in Watertown, one of the oldest houses there, 1698. So, um, but 
you know, everybody, Hamilton House, Jewett House, Eustis, um, all of the properties have um, armchair tours. So, and other departments, the curatorial department and other, you know, preservation services, you know, so the buildings and grounds and the preservation carpenters um, all have various talks. And uh, because of the COVID shutdown, lots of these talks became so popular on Zoom that we were really able to reach, um, you know, in, with deeper topics and uh, a larger audience, in fact. So coming up, um, last year we pr uh, premiered um, a prominent woman architect of the early 20th century, Eleanor Raymond, and that's a talk um, that we um, are presenting. And the LGBTQ talk will be uh, we'll premiere it live and then that will be available. We do the servant um, wing as a Zoom. So lots and lots of things to talk about. And I do an early history of enslavement um, Zoom talk. So yeah, plenty of plenty of topics to choose from. And that's just my little sphere of, of this. Good question though, thanks. Yeah, Joan said she really enjoyed this and she thanks you. Frances, uh, Frances says it was an excellent presentation. Marianne says it was great. Patricia says very informative. Teresa says wonderful. Suzanne's giving you a round of applause, as is Marie. Um, Judy says great presentation and information. I'm glad to see the names of the enslaved, which can be used for ancestry research. And that leads me into a couple of other questions. Yeah. And a, an anonymous attendee asks, did any of the Codmans fight in the Revolutionary or Civil Wars? And Jack asks, was the Codman uh, a slave estate? Did they support slavery? Yes. So um, on the Revolutionary War front, uh, the um, slave-owning Codman, Dr. Charles Russell, so we're still in the Russell family um, prior to the American Revolution, was a loyalist. And uh, um, Dr. Charles um, Russell married into the royal vassal family. So the, the royal um, uh, slave quarters um, in Medford are a historic site, and they're the only slave quarters still extant in New England that you can visit. And um, so not only did Dr. Charles Russell inherit um, enslaved people from um, his grandfather, he was his grandfather's heir, but he married into a slave-owning family. And so two slaves that we know of um, were part of his um, bride's dowry and came to him um, as a loyalist. Uh, and we know he owned um, Lincoln, Zilpa. Their five children were born into um, in slavery. So Zilpa, the daughter, um, Brister was, um, um, had a long and interesting life. Um, so there, unfortunately, the enslaved people are named along with, you know, the bales of hay and the steers and the heifers and, you know, as property. Um, we don't own any objects uh, of, of theirs. The third floor attic space where we um, are pretty sure that Zilpa, the mom, um, did her spinning and weaving. That was destroyed when the attic space was destroyed when the third floor was added. So we don't have spaces for where um, the enslaved people lived and any of their property. So they exist in the family documents as inventory. And, but we have the landscape and the rock walls, you know, somebody had to lug those rocks. And so, um, and we also have John Codman III's documents. And I spent a lot of time during COVID tiptoeing through those documents. And not only was he in trade for himself, but he was in shipping for other um, basically vendors, other um, business people. And so he's trading in um, sugar, rum, molasses, tobacco. Um, and so you know that that's, those are raw materials produced by slave labor. So it's a um, long and deep history. And so the original European colonizer, basically Charles Chambers, was named the um, uh, steward and um, basically caregiver of John Codman III's grandfather, um, John Codman I of Charlestown. And he was um, basically uh, adopted by uh, Charles Chambers um, because he was an orphan. And John Codman I grew up to be Captain John Codman, who was then poisoned by Mark, Phoebe, and Phyllis a very notorious um, 
uh, murder. And they were captured and tried and Mark was hung and gibbeted um, and left as a signpost in Charlestown. And Paul Revere rode past it on his ride. Um, and it was just the tatters of his, you know, his body was tarred um, and just grisly and meant to be. Um, Phoebe was deported to the West Indies where her Basically, that was a death sentence uh, there. And then Phyllis was burned alive at the stake. And a um, uh, contemporary uh, newspaper article, and I quote, um, it provided a fearful spectacle. So the person who meted out those uh, sentences was our slave-owning Chambers Russell. He was a judge in Middlesex County and he sat in judgment on that trial. So the confluence of the Chambers Russell Codman family is intertwined in these very intriguing ways. So come to the revolution um, and Dr. Charles Chambers and is sort of inheriting all of this um, wealth, privilege, land, property and people um, his grandfather, um, he fled to his father-in-law's uh, plantation in Antigua and died there. So the property was actually taken over by um, relatives and cousins who were not loyalists, who were um, basically revolutionaries, and they continued to maintain and pay taxes on the property. So it wasn't taken over by the Con Continental um, uh, Congress. Confusing and complicated, I know. It just, you know, you go down these rabbit holes and it, so we try to keep the story as, you know, kind of um, understandable as possible, but there's a lot of people and personalities and shifts and changes in history. In terms of the Civil War, to answer that question, um, uh, no, no one fought in the Civil War. And what's interesting about Ogden Codman Sr. and Sarah Bradley Codman was, is their ambivalence? to what's happening literally down the road in Concord where the abolition, abolitionist movement is really um, alive and well and thriving. Um, they do not seem to have any connection to that, to that philosophy. And we were curious about that. So we delved into their investments and we know that they were invested in railroads. We know they were invested in mills. And if you're invested in mills then you're invested in cheap cotton. Uh, yes, Janice, yes, says, yes. Janice says, thanks so much for this informative presentation. It was wonderful. Kathleen says, I enjoyed this so much. It is so wonderful seeing how seeing this estate. Thank you so much, Wendy, for your uh, being wonderfully informative. Uh, Christine says, such a thorough, thoughtful, enjoyable presentation. Many thanks. Uh, Ellen says, thanks so much. Excellent information. I need to visit in season. Marianne says, thank you. I will look at the other presentations and I hope to join in. Uh, Lois says, love the photos. They are so well taken. I felt as though I was there. Thank you. And Edward says, great job. I can't wait to visit in person. Uh, Debbie loved this. Francis and Karen say, thank you. Great presentation. Uh, we're going to leave a couple of questions on the cutting room floor, so to speak, but I will provide uh, Wendy's email address in the follow-up email I send later today. So if your question wasn't answered, uh, feel free to reach out to Wendy directly. So Wendy, any last words before we wrap it up? Well, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for spending your morning, um, day and or evening with us. And um, I hope that uh, um, I touched upon something that perhaps um, y'all can relate to in, in this story somewhere in your, own family history, genealogical uh, charts and or, you know, um, locations and communities where you all live. So thank you so much for joining me in my little corner of the world here in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Uh, it was our pleasure, Wendy. Uh, phen phenomenal job. Uh, thanks so much. I hope you and the audience enjoy the rest of their day. So thanks thank again, you everyone. So much. Bye bye. Bye.